work at the School of Informa Informatics and Computing at the Indiana University Bloomington. So the talk of today will be much related to just the previous one. And uh, just to give you a rough idea about what we are talking about, this is just because this is a school. Uh, so what, we, what I mean for a network, a network is a something that is very, very general. So you have a set of uh, units that typically we call nodes or vertices. And these units are interacting in pairs. So the connections are between these units represent some kind of interaction. We will call them edges. Now, this kind of uh, description is very general, so, so that, that many systems in uh, nature can be described by using this very general kind of approach. So one simple kind of example, just to consider the internet. So the network of computers that are connected with the wired or wireless or satellite connection. So they are sharing that. You have network, uh, different types of network, uh, like power grids. So a network composed by power generators that are connected by wires, also in this case. You have uh, transportation networks, so geographical location that are connected by particular type of uh, transportation systems. You can describe, I don't know, like delivery networks, like uh, the this is just a network composed by pipelines that distribute gas in Europe, for instance. You have also natural network like river networks, for instance. Of course, part of networks, especially during the last years, uh, is uh, about social networks. So people are nodes in this network, and they have different types of social relationship. There are also even more strange kind of examples about like, uh, social networks. So for instance, this is like a tennis social network. Each node in the network is a tennis player. Two tennis players are connected if they play a match one against the other. So you can accumulate information and construct this, kind of, this type of network. And uh, you have uh, yeah, information networks like the World Wide Web. You can construct such networks like between scientists, for instance. So people that cite other scientists and so on. And uh, also in the case of biological networks. So it's very, very general kind of uh, approach, neural networks and so on. The problem is that, uh, of course, this kind of uh, description is very so general. So when you have a such kind of general kind of description, you can say something about the system, but not so much. So one thing that is interesting is that, uh, especially during the, the research that was conducted during the last uh, 10 years, is the fact that many topological properties of these systems are similar. Like the degree distribution, so the, the, the fraction nodes that uh, have a certain amount of connections follows typically a broad distribution, like a power law distribution, in many of these systems. Many of these systems have, have like, uh, for instance, show the so-called small world property. So the typical number of OPS that you have to do in order to move from one node of the network to the another node is small compared to the total size of the network. One property that is common in many real networks, well, actually, uh, of course, I mean, there are different ways in which you can describe processes on network. And in order to mathematically describe this kind of system, you can use, typically you use like matrices. So the simplest ca case of the matrices that you can use is uh, just the adjacency matrix. Like if the network is uh, unweighted and undirected, you have a matrix that is uh, with n rows and n columns, depending on the number, of course, of uh, AGL nodes that you have in the network. And you have zeros or ones, depending if there is a connection or not between two nodes in the network. You can also use different types of matrices, depending on the other kind of dynamics. Like uh, if you are considering a simple uh, linear diffusion process, the simplest case, I mean, what you can introduce is the so-called Laplacian matrix. So, you know, I mean, this, this is just a very trivial mathematics, but essentially you have like the variety, you have a certain amount of a, a quantity, it could be like, I don't know, water, for instance, being on a node. Now, the variation in time of this quantity on a node i is just equal to the, the sum over all the vertices that are adjacent to this node i, encoded by this matrix, uh, multiplied by the difference between the amount of 
of this quantity that is in the, in two, in the two nodes. So this is just a uh, diffusion equation. So you can formalize this kind of problem using, a, a, read this kind of problem in uh, terms of uh, matrices, and then define, you realize that essentially the, the matrix that plays a role in this kind of process is the so-called Laplacian matrix. That is given by the efficiency matrix, and the term in front that is a diagonal matrix in which you have essentially the, the degrees along the diagonal of the nodes. Property that is common in many real networks, and this is was uh, already shown in the previous talk, is the fact that these networks often organize in little pieces of them that are called communities, or called uh, clusters, models, as you want. Now, the meaning of this kind of groups can be very different depending on the type of network that you are considering. I don't know, here yeah, I just put some very simple example. If, for instance, if this network is a citation network between papers, a group, a community in this network can be just a, a subset of papers dealing with similar topic of research. If you are considering, I don't know, protein interaction networks, may Maybe a, a community in this network is a group of proteins with similar biological function. If you are considering a social network, of course, a community is nothing more than a group of friends. Now, uh, from the mathematical point of view, a community is defined as a subset in the graph that has a density of internal connection that is higher than what you can observe externally. So like in this, in this case, you can see by eye that essentially this cluster, for instance, has much more connection inside than outside. And uh, now, finding this kind of groups in a network may help to, to get a better understanding of the structure of the network. For instance, in, in, in a certain sense, it's very similar to making a map of the network. So you have uh, communities macro communities, and so on. So you have a different level of communities. It's very similar to what you can do, I don't know, when you get like a geographic map. Imagine that I want to travel from New York to Los Angeles, for instance. So I can analyze this, this kind of uh, system at different scales. I don't know, if I want to get out from my apartment in New York, I don't have an apartment in New York, for instance, but anyway. So I can zoom inside the map of New York, and get the, 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 the route to getting outside New York. Then, of course, I don't care so much about the details. So I can zoom out and travel from uh, New York, you know, in the direction of Chicago, essentially. And from Chicago, I can then reach Los Angeles. And once I'm in Los Angeles, I can zoom in again in the map and look to this kind of things. So essentially, the meaning of communities in, in a network is uh, very, very simple. This one. So de depending on the, the, the type of knowledge that you want to have, you can zoom in or zoom out inside this kind of community structure. For instance, uh, this is a case of uh, just a simple kind of uh, community structure analysis in the, for the air transportation network. So each node in this network is an airport, and nodes in the, in the network are connected if there is a flight, a direct flight between two different airports. You can use different types of representations, uh, for instance, accounting for the number of passengers that are traveling from one airport to the other, or accounting for the number of flights. But it doesn't matter so much. So when you apply such kind of, um, uh, like a community structure algorithm, identification algorithm to this type of network, you realize that the communities are nothing more than basically geographical regions. So what you would expect in this case. So it's able to ca capture, essentially, the geographical division of the airports without having any knowledge about the geographic location of the airports directly. You can do also something more uh, difficult, I don't know, like analyzing, in this case, a uh, community structure of the of a subset of uh, the word association network. So essentially, it's a list of words that people think are associated by different meanings. I mean, in this case, there is also a different kind of concept that is the so-called uh, overlap between communities, because sometimes you have nodes in the network that cannot be classified uniquely in a, in a single group, but can belong to more than one group. Like in this case, this is like a network centered around the word knowledge. You see that it essentially is shared by different clusters. One regards uh, words like expert, professional, beginner, and so on, so some kind of uh, skills. 
The other gas uh, wars connected with the uh, university. You are worse about, uh, yeah, how to define people. You know, there is also Einstein here, for instance. Yeah, other kind of things. Or you can also see, for instance, in general. You see that it's connected with uh, actors or theaters and so on. With music, musical instruments. Of course, with uh, playgrounds or kid toy, with toys and so on, as well with sports. So it's a word that is shared by different communities. Now, this is what has been done more or less up to three, four years ago. So people were considering just single networks. So you were people were was analyzing a social network like Facebook. Facebook, just a single isolated entity. Or, uh, I don't know, the power grid, just the power grid without any connection with other kind of things. But essentially, in reality, these networks do not live isolated but are part of a bigger kind of uh, systems in which essentially you have networks that are interacted with other networks. This is, uh, for instance, in this case you have, you see that there is like the power grid that of course depends on the source of the power, like gas uh, station, but that depends on the, on the other end also on the distribution of the water, also on the, how communication are interrelated, control in this case, and uh, related also with the transportation. Essentially, um, so you, in reality, you cannot consider each network as a, an isolated system, but in order to understand better how they work, what are, what are the properties of this system, you have to consider the fact that they are interacting with other networks. I don't know, just to mention another example, for instance, in the case of uh, social networks. I mean, you can think about you know, Facebook and Twitter. So people in these two networks are essentially the same, right? So they are the same physical person. They are playing a role in both networks. Connections are different. So if you want to study, I don't know, how information spread in the social system, then you have to consider the fact that there are two different networks, not just one. Uh, actually, the beginning of this kind of um, um, field of study in network science was to explain a particular kind of uh, event that happened in my own city. I'm Italian, I'm from Rome. And it was related to these special events that uh, was organized in uh, 2003, in September, called La Notte Bianca, la, literally means uh, the, the white night, the bright night. In French, I think it's like uh, la, la, la Nuit Blanche. Okay. And the idea of this kind of event was the first edition, well, uh, was to essentially leave the city of Rome as during the daylight. So lights up everywhere. So all the touristic attractions were open. All uh, you know, public transportation were working like during the, uh, during the, the day. All the shops were uh, open and so on. I mean, at the time I was about to move to Germany for uh, my PhD, but I was still in Rome. I was not so happy about this kind of event because it was uh, like having a traffic jam also during the night, I mean, from my point of view. But it was also nice because they were organizing a lot of concerts around the city. Now, despite this kind of uh, thing, this kind of event was famous for being actually the darkest night ever in Rome. Actually, that night, there was a blackout that affected all the country. Instant, almost instantaneously. And uh, it was nice because I, mean, I never seen Rome uh, as dark as in the, during that night, essentially. And uh, so in order to explain such kind of phenomenon, the typical way in which people, uh, I mean, especially in statistical physics, to, to use, to use a so-called percolation. So percolation is a very simple kind of model. Uh, in the simplest cases, described as, uh, you know, on the square lattice, you have uh, sites that can be occupied or not with a given probability. And, uh, for instance, imagine that uh, occupied means white in this case. So if you can percolate, this means that if there is a path going from one side to the other, so you can percolate through the lattice. Now, depending on the value of P, you can distinguish two phases. One is per the non-percolating phase and the percolating phase. Percolation is, you can find, I don't know, when you make coffee, for instance, water percolates through the moisture of the coffee. You have percolation when you have, uh, I don't know, 
it rains and water percolates and goes to lakes or uh, rivers, for instance. Now, one property of the percolation is the fact that the transition from one phase to the other is continuous. You see that there is a smooth change from a phase in which you are not percolating and then a continuous phase transition, essentially. Now, you can extend this kind of uh, concept also to networks in which longer percolation, but you can quantify percolation as the, the size of the largest cluster, connected cluster in the network. And typically, this kind of, pro, uh, this kind of model is used in order to, to, to see when a system is working or not. So if you have a large part of the, the system, of course, it's a minimalistic model. Large part of the system is connected. This means that things are working properly. Otherwise, they're not. So one thing that you can do in this case in order to try to explain the blackout in Italy is like consider the power grid of Italy, delete, I don't know, like connection or make failures on the nodes, so the, 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 the power station. But even if you do that, essentially the transition is still continuous. So you cannot explain with such kind of model by considering only the power grid a sudden blackout that affected basically all the country at the same time. You can do that by accounting. The power grid is not living alone, but it depends on the communication system. So if you think, and of course, the communication system depends on the power grid. So it's like, uh, you know, in order to control a power generator, you need a, like a, a internet, a router, right? But in order to have a router that is working, you need energy. So one depends on the other. So when you have a failure in one part of this, you have a failure in the other system. And the failure in this system can cause another failure in another system and so on. You have a cascading failure. The fact that you have cascades essentially generates a discontinuity in the phase transition. You see, instead of having a continuous phase transition, like in this case, you have a sudden jump. So, of course, I mean, this does not explain uh, the reality, what happened in reality, but it tells you what are the ingredients. So it's not, in order to understand better this kind of system, you need to consider the fact that they are interacting. It's also a way of preventing some, such kind of catastro catastrophic uh, failures. Now, to go more into detail of, uh, about the talk of today, so this is more or less what I'm, the system that I'm considering. It's a system composed by two networks that are interacting. You can describe as two layers networks. So you have one node, nodes belonging to one layer and nodes belonging to the other layer. You have a particular kind of topology on one layer, another topology on the other layer, and the set of connection that corresponds to the coupling between the two layers between nodes belonging to different layers. From the mathematical point of view, you can write the entire system as a block adjacency matrix. So along the diagonal, you have the adjacency matrices of both layers, A and B. And off diagonal, you have the coupling between nodes belonging to different layers. Now, depending on the different type of coupling that you can have here, these networks are called uh, interconnected, interdependent, interacting, multiplex, and so on. But in general, I mean, this is the type of description that you can do. Uh, just to give you an example, for instance, in, like in the case of interconnected network, I'm focused, I don't know, on, still on the airport, uh, air transportation network. So one layer can be like North American airport, the other layer is uh, the European uh, airports. So inter-layer connections are flights within the same conti continent, and uh, intra-layer uh, uh, sorry, this vice versa. Interlayer uh, connections are intercontinental flights. Uh, in particular, I will focus on this special case of uh, system. Uh, it looks complicated, but it's not. Essentially, it's nothing more than um, two random networks connected by random connections. The only constraint in the system is the fact that the degree sequence, so the number of neighbors that each node has in, in the layer or with other nodes in the other layer, is a priori specified by the, these degree sequences. So you have an intra-layer degree sequence and an inter-layer degree sequence. Uh, basically, what happened is, uh, is just a generalization of very standard model in uh, using networks that is called the so-called configuration model. 
So once you have fixed the degree sequence, then you connect at random nodes by selecting these half edges. So once it's occupied, you cannot use anymore. The idea is that at the end you have a network that is random, so you have no correlation, but you have a constraint because the degree sequence is a priori fixed. Now, this kind of uh, model, both inside one layer and also between connection with the, the other layer. So one thing that you can still vary, uh, particularly in this case, I will choose, uh, is always simplified. So the, the, the numbers that appear here are the same numbers that appear here. They are just taken from a generic distribution, so the probability distribution of uh, the degrees. But what you can still vary is the correlation between intra and interlayer degree given by this term. Essentially, imagine that you have a set of numbers. I don't know, 1, 2, 3, 5, 100. Here you have the same numbers, but you can change the order. So if they are sorted in the same way, you have maximal correlation. So nodes with high degree, internal degree, have also high interlayer degree. If they are not related, there is, the correlation term is essentially zero. If they are sorted in different orders, you have minimal correlation. The other thing that is uh, changing also is a parameter P. That is the weight of the interlayer, uh, intralayer against intralayer connection. So when P is equal to 1, these connections basically do not exist. When P is equal to 0, you have only connection between layers. And this number can change between 0 and 1, and uh, you can have whatever you want. Now, I will analyze a special kind of uh, process that is so-called random walk. Essentially, it's nothing more than diffusion. So the idea is you have a walker that is moving in the, in the, the graph. Each time that the walker sits on uh, a node, it can jump to the neighbors of the node according to the weight of the, the connections. This process is used uh, in the famous page rank, for instance. It's also uh, you know, it's a basic process that you have also like in electrical networks in which uh, the walkers are the electrons that are moving in the network. And uh, so from the intuitive point of view, when you have such kind of situation, is, uh, this is the idea. I mean, if it's larger than 0 0.5, I expect that this, the intralayer connection are dominating the system. So I expect that the walker, if I start in this layer, I will spend much most of my time in this layer, right? When P is equal to 0 0.5, what I expect is like uh, there is no distinction between uh, intralayer and interlayer inter uh, connections. So basically, the entire network is uh, acting as a single network. There is no distinction between the layers. When P is smaller than 0 0.5, what I expect is that my walker will jump continuously between the two layers. So I will have like an in interlayer uh, uh, diffusion process. Actually, the, 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 uh, this is what we expect by intuition, but this is not what happened in reality. In order to understand what happens in this kind of system, we can look to a special kind of operator that essentially is, uh, is the Laplacian operator normalized. And in particular, try to solve the problem related to the eigenvalues and eigenvector of this kind of operator. So an eigenvalue and eigenvector are nothing more than, uh, the eigenvector is nothing more than a vector that is uh, basically invariant under the application of the operator, of the Laplacian operator in this case, because this application is nothing more than uh, equal to the vector itself multiplied by some real factor, because these are networks, symmetric networks, so all the eigen eigenvalues are just real numbers. Now, the one uh, eigenvector of this kind of operator is trivial in the sense that it's the one that determines the stationary distribution of the random walker in the network. Essentially, this is nothing more than the solution of the page rank, somehow. Uh, what matters are the other eigenpairs of this kind of operators? Because one thing is about the stationary distribution, the other thing is how the walker approaches the stationary distribution. So it's the true dynamics of the system, if you can see. And in this special kind of system, what uh, really matters are the other two extreme eigen eigenpairs of the operator. So the second smallest and the largest eigenvectors. 
of uh, normalized Laplace. Now, when you analyze this kind of system, you realize that you can uh, get insights about the structure of the, the system that I was showing you before by looking to the spectrum of the normalized uh, Laplace. So, for instance, when you expect to be in the bipartite phase, so P is much more than 0 0.5, you see, I mean, in all cases, you see that there is always an eigenvalue that is equal to 0. This is the one that corresponds to the stationary distribution. It's trivial. So the stationary distribution is always the same, OK? But when you, have, uh, you are in the bipartite phase, you see that there is a, another non-trivial eigenvalue that is outside the spectrum. So if you look to the eigenvector component of corresponding to this eigenvalue, you are able to distinguish the fact that the system is composed by two layers that in this case are bipartite graph. You see that when you are in this indistinguishable phase, so p equal to 0 0.5, this eigenvalue that was outside the spectrum is inside the spectrum. So from the spectral point of view, you cannot distinguish this network from just a random network. In an analogous way, when you are in the decoupled phase, you see that the second smallest eigenvalue now is outside the spectrum. Now, the spectrum can be predicted by this kind of expression. You see, essentially, it's nothing more than, uh, so all the eigenvalues different from um, this one, essentially, that is always equal to 0, are in a radius of round 1, and the radius given by 2 times the divided by the square root of the average degree of the network. Now, the main point using this kind of approach is to understand when I vary p, to understand if when this eigenvalue gets inside, absorbed by the rest of the spectrum. At this point, there is a transition between this bipartite phase, for instance, and the I phase. Or from the I phase to the D phase when this other eigenvalue is outside of the spectrum. So you can do a bit of uh, mathematics uh, in the case of, uh, I can solve exactly in the case in which uh, uh, there is a perfect correlation between the two. So the, both degree sequences are uh, exactly identical. So here you have, I don't know, one, one, three, three, exactly the same numbers. In this case, you can realize that the, 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 the true, I mean, the, the, the eigenvalue that uh, is able to detach the structure of this system is given by this linear expression in P. And uh, you can basically realize also from this kind of, as you see, that uh, essentially the eigenvector components of the largest eigenvector are linearly correlated with the square root of uh, the degree of the nodes when you are in the bipartite phase. And you cannot see the same for the, the, the second smallest eigenvector. When you are in the indistinguishable phase, so the no eigenvalues outside this uh, spectrum, there is no correlation between eigenvector components and the uh, degree of the nodes. And when you are in the other phase, it's exactly the opposite. So you have a linear correlation between this and this. You can analyze also using, you know, such, I don't know, like uh, order parameters, like the sum of the components of the eigenvector, second smallest or uh, largest eigenvector, of, um, of the components just of the single layer. You see that essentially there is a jump instantaneous jump in this case. And of course, by comparing directly the expression obtained by Chung with this expression, that the prediction that I showed you before, you can predict what are the critical points of these changes, or the distinction between the two phases, given by this kind of expression. You can do also something if you let the degree sequence, this degree sequence not longer exactly identical, but just, uh, you know, same numbers, but ordered in a different way. So what in this case is that uh, still you have the same type of uh, linear correlation between components and, and different type of expression. Of course, the, the correlation in this case is not perfect, uh, like in the case before. So you have to use uh, like a first order approximation. It's just the, the average behavior of this kind of, um, of the components. You can use such kind of expression as an ansatz in the eigenvalue problem and derive this kind of expression. Uh, derive this kind of expression. That is, looks pretty much complicated. But essentially, you have just uh, 
function of p, so the, the weight, the, this relative weight between intra and inter uh, connections, the moments of the distribution, especially the second moment, and the correlation term. Now, when you do exactly the same, so you do the comparison between what you expect in a random graph with what you expect in a graph in which you can see the structure between the two layers, so you basically you equate this expression to this expression, you find that the critical points are given by this very, apparently very complicated expression. But the main point of this kind of thing is the fact that the existence, you see, of this term inside the square root. Now, this term can be larger or smaller than zero. So when it's larger than zero, this means that there, there are real solution, and uh, there is a sort of intersection between different eigenvalues. So you can see you can track these kind of things. Of course, when this is smaller than zero, there are not longer real solution. So apparently, there is not longer a possibility of jumping from the the coupled phase to the indistinguishable phase, and from the indistinguishable phase to the bipartite phase. You can understand better this kind of uh, thing by looking to uh, one of the point, of course, is the term inside of the square root depends on the correlation. So higher depends on the. But you can understand better from by looking to the phase diagram. So here, this, this is basically p. This is the difference between the second moment of distribution and the correlation. So when the correlation is maximal, this is basically equal to zero. So the correlation can be equal to the second moment of the distribution. You see, essentially, there are three different and well distinct phases. So by ch if you move in this direction, essentially, you can distinguish between a decoupled phase, this I phase, and the B phase. By tuning the parameter P, essentially, you can change the phase of the system. But the nice thing is that there exists a critical value of the correlation term, after which, essentially, there is not longer a distinction between phases. So this I phase do not, does not longer exist. But there is a phase in which is a sort of hybrid phase in which, essentially, you can observe simultaneously bipartite and decoupled phase simultaneously. Now, this kind of behavior is called, uh, in this kind of regime, what you have is essentially the fact that both the non-trivial eigenvalues are outside the spectrum simultaneously. And the components of the eigenvector that are associated to these eigenvalues are simultaneously correlated with this kind of, with a degree, essentially. <coughs> And uh, you can monitor this kind of transition in different ways. I don't know, still by, you see, essentially, this is like uh, the, the um, largest eigenvalue, second smallest eigenvalue. This is what you expect from the semicircle law of Chung. You see that, essentially, you never touch where well, you touch beta because the system is finite. But you do not touch the, uh, the, the, the rest of the spectrum at before 0 0.5, as you would expect by intuition. At the same time, if you look to another parameter, like the sum of the components, you see that essentially there is, in this region, in 0 0.5, they are both larger than 0. So this is an indication that you are in this hybrid phase. Uh, yeah. Now, this hybrid phase has a nice action with physical systems. And this is why I call uh, the, 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 the phase a supercritical regime, essentially. And this is something that is, uh, you can observe in any kind of um, ma uh, matter, like, I don't know, even water. So you know, I mean, water, uh, this is like the typical phase diagram of water. So you have uh, pressure and temperature. So you have three different phases, typically, right? Water can be ice, solid. It can be gas, so vapor, or it can be liquid, it could be water, essentially. So by changing the, the temperature and pressure, you can change between the three different phases. And these phases are well distinct, right? Now, there is, there is anyway a so-called critical point about which there is not longer a distinction between a liquid and a vapor. 
And this is called, the, it's called a supercritical fluid in this re regime. So I want to show you, I don't know, have you never heard about uh, supercritical fluids or? Uh, no? So just to give you an example of this kind of. Uh, how much time I do have? Huh? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Come on. Does it work? I yes, served for eleven and a half years. Oh, no. sorry. We're not seeing it. Okay. Uh, there is an advertisement. Uh -huh. I'm not sponsorized. Huh? <laughs> this is a demonstration that we use for school children and, and others about um, explaining the sort of research I do. So there is a, a little cell here, where, and this is a television camera, which goes on big picture up here. Now, the important thing is that this is not a, a video. So if, you look, if I shake the table, the whole thing shakes. And what is actually in here in the picture, there is a liquid sealed into a cell with gas above it, the vapor. Now, it could be water and steam. It's not water, but it's similar. So if we start heating this, what did you do just then? I just flipped this switch and switched on the heater. So the temperature, you can see, is going up. And as the temperature goes up, this begins to boil. So you can see it begins to boil. And as it boils, material goes from the liquid into the gas. And as it goes into the gas, the gas gets denser because it can't escape. It's a sealed cell, but the liquid, because it's being heated, expands. So this becomes less dense, that becomes denser, and eventually they become the same density, and the line in between it completely disappears. So you can see it's almost gone now, and what happens is that you then have a gas which has about half the density of the liquid, and this is a so-called supercritical fluid. And I first saw this demonstration, or one similar to this, about 20 years ago, and I was completely hooked. And I've been researching on this ever since. Now, it's even more fun. OK. So, <laughs> so essentially, I mean, this kind of um, phase that we found in uh, the case of uh, interconnected network is analogous. I mean, this is, of course, is a speculation. But the point is that there, is, there are two different uh, type of diffusion that takes place on the network simultaneously. So what happens? If you run uh, like a simulation about a random walker in this kind of system, you can measure, for instance, like what is the probability of the same layer for a certain number of consecutive steps. So when you are essentially in the, this supercritical regime, you see that the same, you have a very long, I mean, lo much longer, uh, there is a higher probability of staying of staying in the same layer for a long time, longer time. But simultaneously, there is also uh, the higher probability of, stay, of changing layers continuously for longer period of time. So uh, when you do things a bit more carefully, and uh, essentially, you can, what you can do is like, I mean, just describe the sequence of a random worker moving in the system by saying, OK, it's plus if I'm staying in the same layer between two consecutive steps, or it's a minus if I change layer. Then I can measure, I don't know, like the autocorrelation function, for instance, of this sequence, and measure the so-called spectral density of the correlation function, autocorrelation function. These are the results of what you obtain. So when you are in the undistinguishable phase, and p is equal to 0 0.5, there is no distinction between the two layers. So what you see is completely a flat line. So diffusion is taking uh, place over the system without telling you anything about the structure of the system. When P is smaller than 
the value that tells you that basically you are in the decoupled, reg in the, the decoupled regime, you see that essentially there are peaks at higher frequencies uh, in the bipartite regime, because you are continuously changing the layer. When you are in the, the, the coupled regime, you have a peak around zero. So you have only intralayer diffusion. When you are in the supercritical regime, you have two peaks simultaneously, intralayer and interlayer diffusion. So this is just the negation of the supercritical regime. So what are the consequences? Imagine that now I'm measuring a, some, just a basic quantity, like a, I start a run, uh, to make a random, wo random worker moving in the network at a given node, and I calculate how much time this random worker takes in order to explore the entire system. Okay, this is what is so-called the cover time. Typically, it's rescaled by the total number of ages. You see that when you are in the supercritical regime, the cover time is much smaller than what you observe in the other regimes. So this kind of recipe can be used in order to control the diffusion on the network. So imagine that you have uh, like a transportation system, so you want to Im Im improve diffusion. So the best thing is to move, change local properties of the system in order to go in this supercritical regime. But imagine that you want, uh, for instance, to contain diffusion, like in uh, epi epidemic processes. In that case, you have to change the properties of local properties of the system in order to bring the system in outside the supercritical regime. Now, what is the relation with the communities? The relation is that you can just draw a very simple mathematical uh, kind of analogy between the two systems. So in the simplest case, you can imagine one layer is a community, the other layer is another community. Now, the methods that you can use in order to find this, essentially finding communities is nothing more than finding the right compartments in which you have to place the different nodes. Finding the, the partition, essentially, the best partition. There are different methods in which you can... Uh, five minutes, still? Still five minutes? Okay. So you can, for instance, maximize the, the modularity function. Uh, we're not going into the detail of the modularity function, because, but essentially it's nothing more than the difference between the actual connection that you can observe minus what you, as, you would expect in a random model, in, which, in the configuration model, essentially. You realize that you can maximize the modularity function using a spectral method by looking to a special matrix that is called the modularity matrix, finding the, the largest eigenvector of this, uh, eigenvector of this matrix. You can use also other methods like uh, finding, uh, you know, the, the so-called minimum cut problem. So you look to the Laplacian uh, matrix and find the second smallest second pair. Depending on the sign of the components of this uh, vector, you can split the system into parts. Or you can use also random walk. You know, what by intuition is the fact that if you have clusters, you have a walker that is moving in the network, most of the time, when you are inside a cluster, the walker will move inside the cluster again. So we'll spend a lot, long time inside clusters, and only from time to time we'll jump to different clusters. Then stay in the cluster again, and so on and so on. So when you do such kind of uh, analogy, then uh, you can imagine, for instance, like the system is, uh, again, the same. The only difference is that imagine that here you can have, um, I don't know, <coughs> certain amount of connections was averages given by K internal, so average number of connections inside one group, average number of connections in the same group is the same, average number of connections between different groups per node. We can think about uh, a particular kind of constraints in which essentially these two quantities are always constrained being equal to a certain constant. And the difference between these two quantities tell us how good the community are. So by intuition, what we expect is when delta is larger than zero, communities are well-defined, right? So we are able, if you apply an algorithm in order to identify these communities, we will are able, essentially, to, to identify these two groups. When delta is equal to zero, essentially, there are no distinction between the groups. And when delta is smaller than uh, zero, we are somehow able to find the distinction between groups because they are less connected what, than what expected, right? It's a bipartite graph. Actually, when you apply a spark algorithm to this problem, you encounter a so-called detachability threshold. So if the difference delta is smaller than a critical value, you are not able to detach the cluster correctly. So they are well-defined, 
but the algorithm is not able to identify them. Of course, after, after this kind of uh, threshold, the algorithm starts to correctly identify the, the clusters. Now, when the correlation, also in this case you have a correlation, depending on the, 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 the sequences are uh, aligned. When the correlation is uh, neutral, this is the particular value of the correlation of the, the disability threshold that you find. And this is well-known result in uh, li literature about community structure. But the main point is that also in this case, the, the disability threshold depends on the correlation term, not only on the difference between average internal degree and average external degree. And the nice thing is that this leads to a sort of paradox. Uh, I will tell you later about the background, but essentially you can redraw essentially the same phase diagram that I showed you before, in which here you have delta, here we have the still version. These are the phases in which you are, the, 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 the groups are detachable, and this is the, the region in which the group is not detachable. Now, the para, uh, this happens to, to work well, of course, with all the spectral algorithms that finds communities, as you can see here. You see, essentially, that delta is smaller when the correlation is minimal. As, and increase as the correlation increase. And the paradox is the, the following. So in this case, when delta is larger than zero and, and C is equal to the maximum uh, um, value of the correlation, each single node has more connection inside than outside. So by definition, by intuition, this is a well-defined community. Nevertheless, algorithms are not able to find them. When delta is larger than zero and C is equal to the minimum value, of the, uh, these are a sort of ill-defined community. There are some nodes that have, have more connection inside than outside, but as well, the vice versa. And in this case, algorithms are able to find the presence of these groups. But this works not only for spectral algorithms, but also if you use uh, other kind of maximization uh, uh, algorithms, modularity maximization algorithms, works for not only for two groups, but also for four groups. And uh, this is just my last slide. These are the references to the work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Normalized Laplacian is, yeah, is uh, nothing more than the Laplacian in which you divide by the, the degree of the nodes. Because you want to conserve the, the, the mass, essentially. You know, if you want questions, you're going to have to say something that touches other things that have been said in this uh, summer school. Otherwise, all they can do is contemplate your, your uh, model. I think we have one question. Good. <laughs> I, uh, I, I enjoyed your talk. Um, very interesting. Uh, I, I wanted to know how you compare the uh, the clustering analysis that you're doing here to uh, the clustering analysis that we saw in the previous talk. So you're using interconnectivity, especially if I'm understanding correctly, to individuate clusters, uh, whereas uh, the talk just before was using um, properties shared by groups of nodes. So if do you, do you have like a, an opinion maybe on how these, these methods compare or complement? No, I mean, uh, this kind of algorithms uh, are called spectral uh, algorithms, are very uh, standard methods. Mm -hmm. They do not work so well. Okay. Uh, but are, uh, one thing that is good about this kind of algorithms that are based on uh, some kind of uh, intuitive notion, like diffusion, for instance, mm -hmm. or minimum cut. So they are very intuitive. The, the performance is not good enough, but it's, uh, so there is not a direct connection. I think uh, it's, a, it's a different, also because it was not looking really to communities, but to different kind of structure, structural properties, right? Thank you. So Petko Valce from UCAM. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understood that uh, the uh, normalized Laplacian is the solution of page rank. No, the normalized Laplacian is a special kind of Laplacian which you divide by the, um, the degree, essentially, of the nodes. Right. And of course, it's, uh, it's related to the, uh, to the transition matrix that you use in uh, random walks, yeah. Right. So what in page rank, what you have, the difference is that you have also the um, relocation term, right? 
Right. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Uh, the question is then: uh, this existence of uh, different eigenvalues is very interesting. Um, is there a way to compute them in the page rank uh, uh, mode? Then, uh, starting with some initial values in every node, and then making transitions? Or I'm completely wrong with that? No, I think also in that case, I mean, basically, page rank is based on diffusion. Yeah. It's, uh, but one thing is that this regards how you reach the stationary distribution. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, page rank is the stationary. It's based on the stationary probability of finding the random walker in a given node, right? It's nothing more than that. OK. So if you define a page rank that accounts for the um, how you reach the stationary distribution, uh, yeah, you can have the more or less similar kind of effects. OK. OK, thank you. Yeah. I probably have to interact with you in a more okay. one to one uh, uh, mode. Okay. Thank, you. Yes. thank you, anyway. Are there any other questions? Yeah. I have a second question. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Hey, my head. Um, so, so I've been my head. So, I was wondering um, how, the, well, if the techniques you have here, uh, was they presented here, can help us protect uh, networks of networks against cascades of catastrophes happening? If, yeah. Well, um, first of all, one thing, I mean, everything here is based on random, yep. randomness. I mean, you have random models. Accounting for the fact that uh, network, real networks are not random, then you can relate, uh, yes, the sort of, I mean, not really for the normalized Laplacian, for the combinatorial Laplacian, there is a so-called algebraic, algebraic connectivity. That is, that is a lower bound for the age and node connectivity. That is the one that uh, really matters in the case of uh, robustness of the systems. So you can, uh, yes, you can uh, have some clue how to make the, the system stronger. Actually, I have another paper about uh, that. Uh, yeah. okay. okay, so maybe a, a follow up question to uh, Petro's question. Um, so, and maybe also to interact with the room. Can you uh, clarify for me uh, how much knowledge do you need about the graph and centralized knowledge to, to calculate what you're calculating? Because one, I mean, I really appreciate the analysis you're doing, uh, but there are some hypotheses for me behind, for instance, that I have the full knowledge of the graph. Is it true or not? I need uh, the full knowledge of the graph to be centralized somewhere. Well, in order to calculate the, uh, the spectrum, you need the, the full knowledge of the graph, yeah. yes. So it was also a link to Petro's question in the sense that um, another way to do that is if you find a distributable algorithm or a parallelizable algorithm like the patient one, mm -hmm. then you, you might escape the central uh, centralization problem. Well, in page rank, you, you also need the, to, to know the topology of the graph, right? Well, one, one of the things, yeah, but, but what I'm saying is that when, when you want to work on a matrix, most of the time you need the matrix to be somewhere. You need to centralize it at one point. Uh, when you do the diffusion, you might have different sources and work on distributed diffusion. In your case, how much of the calculation could be distributed and not centralized? If I wanted to do that on a huge graph, but I don't have all the data centralized of the graph at, on one node. Is that feasible, what you're calculating right now? So you're saying if there is a way of uh, approximating like the true solution by having just an a partial an knowledge. Of approach of that. Like. Uh, first of all, it depends on what you mean for partial knowledge. So if you are monitoring just uh, nodes, for instance. Uh, let's say, let's say uh, each node has the local knowledge uh, of the graph, which, we, which is the usual case. Like in routing table, you only have uh, each router only has a. Maybe a good possibility, uh, possibility could be like, uh, imagine that you start like a message like uh, from a given node, and you let this message such a uh, Making a random walk in the network, you count I don't know how many times or after uh, how much time it comes back. So in this way, you can somehow approximate this uh, the centrality in terms of page, uh, like page rank centrality of a node. Yeah. And I had another question, unless uh, questions in the room. Yeah. Um, when we started to to work on community de detection, uh, we also were working with sociologists. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
And one of the first things one of them told us is this community never exists, which was a bit upsetting, doesn't exist, which was a bit upsetting for us. Uh, and, but I think it's true, and they, um, he's right, because uh, you, uh, you always project a community depending on your, what you're looking at on the network, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that they're always changing, always moving. And it's extremely hard to define what is a community and to follow it, uh, to it change. Now, one interesting thing in your uh, analysis, of, uh, if I understand it well, is would be to follow the life and the evolution of it. So to include the dynamics and the changes. And how easy is it to account for the changes of the network without recalculating everything at, it, at every change and try to follow the life of a network as it evolves? Well, first, let me comment. I mean, you're right. Uh, communities are not, uh, well, first of all, when you apply like uh, an, an algorithm for the identification of communities in a network, some, very often, these do not match so well with the, the a priori knowledge of the community in the network, unless the, 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 the structure is very well defined. And um, also, um, No, I mean, you can monitor, uh, essentially, yeah. I mean, one, one simple way in which you can monitor the evolution of the network, also the structure of the community, is like taking a snapshot of the network at different instances of time and see how things evolve. So, so if uh, there are formation of new communities, uh, like by merging two different communities, if they split, uh, or uh, and uh, yeah, these kind of things. But in general, I mean, uh, the notion of community is like uh, very, very strict compartments. It's, uh, it's not the only notion that you can have. It's also, you, you know, you can have also partic participation ratio to different kind of groups. Overlapping. You can be, yeah, overlapping, these kind of things, yeah. Question in the room? Eager for coffee? Yeah. Let's send the speaker again then.